In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. Dispel from us the works of darkness and grant us to live in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, that our faith may never be found wanting through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is recorded for us in Zephaniah, the first chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. Be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more, all who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is recorded for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. St. Paul tells us, Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day no sur- is no surprise to you like a thief. And you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober." having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you were doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus tells us, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you deliver to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you deliver to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of the master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours." But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gather where I have scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he who has in abundance." But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Together we confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Back several years ago, I had a friend who worked for an organization that provided limited grant money to community entrepreneurs. The grant applicants would write their grant proposals and then they would meet with a committee to go over their business plan, to talk about how they planned on investing or planned on using the money. And then there was a promise that later on they would come back and they would share with what they had done. They would give evidence of how the money was used. Well, after hearing a sermon on today's gospel, Matthew 25, 14 to 30, my friend told me a story that said he struck with him um, as being somewhat similar to this parable. The committee granted three grants. 
7000 to one person, 2500 to another, and $1,500 to a third person. Now, the person with the $7,000 took the money and used it to help start a house cleaning business. He worked hard for a year, and at the end of the year, he came back to the committee, and because he had been so successful, because he had used that money wisely, because everything had just fallen right into place, he volunteered to donate $7,000 back to the organization because he wanted to help other people get a start in business as well. And the person who had received the $2,500 started a lawn care business, and at the end of the year, he came back and he donated 1000 back to the organization because he wanted to help other people as well. The third person, however, the one with the $1,500, took the money, and he was scared that he would fail. He was afraid that the committee would be mean. He was afraid that the committee would criticize him. And so he took the money and he put it in a lockbox and at the end of the year, he brought it back and he placed it on the table and he said, here, take this back. I didn't use it. Give it to someone else. Today's gospel reading from Matthew isn't complicated, though it can indeed be somewhat startling when we start trying to apply it to our own lives. Jesus tells about a man who leaves his servants in charge and that when he leaves, he makes sure that he gives them his money to use in wise ways. He makes them responsible for varying amounts of money based on the skill that he knows that they have. To one, he gives five talent coins, that is about in today's money, $100,000. To another, he gives two talents, that's approximately $40,000. And to a third, he gives one talent, which is about $20,000. And then when he returns, the first two servants report they invested the money and they return double the amount that they had been given. And he says to them, well done, good and faithful servants. Come on in and share my joy. But the servant who had been given one talent coin was afraid that he would lose the money if he invested it. And what's even more important is that he, it, he didn't just hold on to the money, he buried it in the ground to keep it away from being used. And that now he returns it and he says that he is afraid of the master. He says that he knows that the rich man isn't a very good man and that he is afraid, just totally afraid, doesn't believe in any kind of a promise. And the rich man is unhappy, and the servant had wasted an entire opportunity to use what he had been given. And he calls the servant useless, and he has him thrown out into the darkness. And so what is Jesus saying to us today? Like the servants in the parable, God entrusts us to take care of what is precious to him. He has given us our lives he has given to us people whom we love and people who love us. He has given us the world with all of its wonder and beauty. We belong to God. Referring to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us to rescue us from sin and death, Paul says, you do not belong to yourselves but to God. He bought you for a price. He has given us gifts and abilities. He has given them to us in varying degrees. The greatest gift that he has given to all of us is the gift of the gospel, the gift of the good news of Jesus Christ who died on the cross and who rose again, forgiving our sins and bringing us new life. And he gives us those gifts through his word, through baptism, through Holy Communion. And what's more, he gives us a fellowship of believers, a group of Christians that we call the church where we mutually support one another and we mutually hear each other's concerns and sins and we mutually declare forgiveness. Jesus is a bit like the master in the parable. When he returns, he will want to know what we have done with all that he has given us. We, he'll want to know how we have treated the world in which we live. He'll want to know what we've done with the knowledge that he has given us. 
He'll want to know what we have done with our bodies. He will want to know whether we have been pleasant or whether we have been unkind. And he'll want to know what we've done with the lives for which he died on the cross. Jesus is going to return and want to know what we've done with the good news message of forgiveness and eternal life. Have we received it, treasured it, kind of hidden it away because we were afraid as unbelievers that God is a cruel God, a mean God? Or have we actually used it and has, have we used it for some good return in the lives of people? Has the new life that God has given us through the cross of Jesus made any difference in our attitude towards our neighbors or attitude towards our families or attitude towards the work that we have been given? Does it make any difference in how we spend our money? Does it make any difference in how we get along with our parents, our children, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our church members? Has the gospel moved us to serve others who are less fortunate? When we stop and think about it, God has blessed us with so many, many exorbitant gifts, way too many to count. He has not been stingy by any stretch of the imagination. The idea, though, that God will call us to give an account of how we have used those gifts challenges us to think about quite a few things, such as, what gifts has God given me? Has he given me gifts? Well, yes, he has. And how well am I using those gifts? Am I using them well? Using them not at all? What possibilities and opportunities has God given me to make a difference in someone's life, to invest in their future with the good news message of Jesus? Or have I been like the third servant and refused to take any kind of risk and has simply hidden away what God has given me? What about all of those times that I have said or thought things like, um, I could do it, but I'm too busy, or I don't want to be bothered, or let someone else do it. And let's be clear about this one thing. It isn't so much the size of the return that the rich man is concerned about. After all, he would be satisfied if the third servant had simply put the money in the bank and let it earn interest. Jesus is rather talking about our attitudes, our willingness to do as God has designed for us to do, our eagerness to risk what he has given us for the sake of the kingdom, just as Jesus risked himself for our sake. The man is condemned to the darkness because he is unwilling, reluctant. He is unbelieving. He is convinced that the master is not good all out of disbelief. So the story is about possibilities. The parable is about opportunities. This event is about being entrusted. It's about being generous in our trust. The story is about the owner sharing the joy of what is his, of reaping the benefits for his people, enjoying its profits. It's a story about someone putting into your hands something really important, something really precious, and saying, now see what you can do with that. The story is telling us to do nothing, to take no risks, to not use what God has given us, to keep to ourselves what God has selected to give to each of us is a sin. It's a lesson about attitude and responsibility, about using God's treasures. So the story that Jesus tells is a wake-up call for his disciples. Jesus is coming again, and there will be that moment when he asks us how well we have done. And Jesus' intent with the parable is to stir us up, to get us to thinking, to have us reevaluate how we use the gifts that God has given us. I can say quite confidently, though, as I look at people out there and I look at the human life around us, I realize that no one is a perfect manager of God's gifts. That's because of our sinful nature. Just think about our lives. Just think about the way that we have failed. We know that the Holy Spirit does indeed help us, that the gospel does indeed motivate us, that there are things that we have done, and yet we think about all of those times where we have failed miserably. We think about those times when we have not done as our Lord has called us to do. 
And but the good news is, more than any news at all, is that as people who are convicted of our sin, we cry out to him, O Lord, forgive us, and we know that he has already forgiven us, and that is the greatest gift of all. We have cried out in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins, and we have cried out in the confession of sin, forgive us, Lord, and we have heard that good news message that we are forgiven entirely for what Christ has done. We are, as God's people, forgiven completely, continually given the responsibility and the encouragement to share with the people around us. He has equipped us with his gifts, and he provides us with opportunities. So we go out and we do what we can. And as we go and we do what we can, we don't always do it perfectly. And sometimes we may even do it grudgingly. And sometimes when we do it, we fall flat on our face. And sometimes we confess that as we're doing it, we are, we are sitting there grumbling at every single moment. But rather we also understand that as people who have been forgiven, that he looks at us and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ Jesus has done. Now the, may the peace that passes all our human understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty Father, as the great day of the Lord draws even nearer when your Son will return to judge the living and the dead, we pray that you would grant your people to remain faithful to the end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, though we do not know the day or hour of your Son's appearing, grant that we would always be prepared by sending us faithful pastors and teachers who will boldly proclaim your word of law and gospel to us, that we may be constantly encouraged and build up in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to always be good and faithful servants who are diligent stewards of all that you so graciously provide. Especially grant us to be generous in speaking of the salvation that you provide for us through your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting Father, you have given us the gift of your creation and though this world is passing away due to sin, we pray that you would preserve it for our use and provision until you usher in the new creation to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, we pray that you would grant healing and relief to all who are afflicted in mind, body, or soul. Give them the peace and comfort that only comes through Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, until your Son returns in glory, he has given us the supper of his body and blood to sustain us. Grant that all who receive this gift today may receive it in faith, trusting that it is given for them for the forgiveness of their sins and life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Lord, we give thanks for all the faithfully departed Grant comfort to all who mourn that they may find peace and hope in the resurrection of the dead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.